I'm going to introduce our next USDA Think Water Fellow, Daniel Weller, who's going to give you a riveting talk on protein, which completely changed my mind on a bunch of things. So, show him some love without delay, Daniel. So, as Laura said, I'm going to be talking today about applications of decision making for fresh produce safety. Now, the first question I get when I tell people that I work on produce safety is what is it and why do I care? Well, in the most general sense, you care because there's a significant uh, morbidity and mortality associated with people and disease worldwide. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that there are 600 million cases of people and disease per year, and that would roughly 400,000 of these result in death. If you notice this graph right here, this is the number of uh, daily adjusted life years that are lost to specific foodborne pathogens every year. What I want to point out is that specific pathogens are associated with the loss of more than a million daily per year. And then within produce-borne disease, there's, produce, there's different foods that are associated with it. The single ingredient food that is associated with the most illnesses for outbreak and the most outbreaks in the United States is fresh produce. In fact, fresh produce is associated with twice as many illnesses and outbreaks as meat, which wherever meat is, somewhere around here, uh, which is kind of the food that is in the public mind of being associated with food-borne diseases. Now, who knows why, this is a rhetorical question, by the way, uh, why this picture is here. So in 2011, there was a cantaloupe outbreak that resulted in the death of 33 people. Um, so there was clearly a human cost to this outbreak. However, there was also a major economic cost in that the um, number of melons that were sold nationwide decreased by 50 this actually shifted the center of production out of traditional centers and other places and actually out of the country as well. So because of the uh, major economic and health burden associated with foodborne diseases, there's a lot of interest in public health officials, government, and uh, industry uh, to prevent produce contamination. And so past studies have shown that you can prevent produce contamination in the pre-harvest and the post-harvest environment, so that the low level contamination that happens in the pre-harvest environment can contaminate post-harvest environments where the uh, pathogens can then proliferate and contaminate larger growth products. So a lot of the research and interest is in preventing this pre-harvest contamination. However, this is really tough because the pre-harvest environment does not exist in a vacuum. The pre-harvest environment is affected by the adjacent natural and local environment. So there's a lot of different moving parts that are both part of the uh, farm landscape as well as management practices. As a result, any action we take will impact food safety, and any food safety measure we implement will have unexpected environmental, economic, and even food safety consequences both the short and long term. This is kind of your classic looking problem. I'm going to call this the co-management problem. I how do we co-manage a farm landscape for economic, ecological, food safety, and among other uh, interests. Now. As a result, kind of the land management practices that are implemented on a farm are the result of a complicated cost benefit analysis. However, the cost and benefits that the uh, manager decides to use in their analysis is really dependent on the goal as well as the mental model they have with the harvest environment. And so this is where system thinking can be useful in kind of tackling this co-managed issue. This can help us then understand different perspectives as well as create an integrated way of viewing uh, the harvest environment. And now that's really, again, because I keep saying it's a really complicated Situation to so to show how this can be used, I'm going to focus in on one very small part, which is my personal favorite part, and that's water. So I'm going to show how you can view water within the farm landscape from an economic, ecological, and safety perspective. And I'm going to go through it quick, so read it in my talk. So this is the economic perspective, and the main thing I want you to notice is that it's all focused on profit, and most of the aspects of the most of the distinctions of this business model have been monetized. So water quality is monetized in terms of the cost of the treat, treat the water. Water availability is monetized in the fact that you have to pay for water in some places, and that's also going to impact the crop yield. If you look at it from the ecological perspective, nothing's monetized. There's a whole different set of distinctions in this model. Most of them don't overlap with the previous model, and everything is focused on water quality, its impact on the water microbiome, on habitat quality, and on things like so if we then go to the food safety perspective, it's not even focused on water. It's focused on the pathogens that the water can transfer from the environment or in the water itself. So I kind of got ahead of me for a second, sorry. So now the problem becomes, how do we integrate these disparate models now that we have used some thinking to kind of conceptualize different 
objectives top and bottom. Um, and that's really not easy. What you can see here is I've tried to group those, all those three different models together, and we've lost a lot of the small scale relationship distinction uh, that made up these early models. And we still don't have a great picture of that whole farm. What we can say is we almost, we can't see the forest or the leaves because we're looking at the tree. And as a result, it's really difficult to identify the digestible chunks of this problem, focus our research and intervention efforts on. Now, that's not only a problem with the complexity of the model itself, it's problematic because a lot of the research that's being done is being done in different fields that really don't communicate with each other. So if you're, let's say, a graduate student who's trying to do their dissertation on this topic, trying to figure out where the research is, it's not very easy. So we're going to look at one part of the, one part of this, a much smaller, smaller scale, it's so small you don't even see it on that earlier model, and that's the transfer to and die off of pathogens on proteins. So in 2015, I conducted a study to, to look at this, and before even conducting the study, I wanted to kind of simplify my understanding of the process. So basically said, I have pathogens coming from a source, in this case, and as in much of my research, too. Um, it then transfers to produce, and then once it's on the produce, produce gets harvested. It transfers from the source via splash due to irrigation or rain, and then it dies off on produce during the course of its time there due to weather and, uh, well, generic passing time. So once I conducted my study, I then had to kind of place it within the body of existing research. And this was really tricky because a lot of the research has been done in plant pathology, physics, biophysics, fields that I have no background in. So what I did is literally as I read papers, I would put information on the papers directly onto my model. So I could visualize. For example, I put information on their study design, their goals, pathogens they use, as well as their findings. So what, here what you have is you have the produce item at irrigation or after rain, you have it at harvest, and you have the die off rate. So these all used a linear model, that's this line. I used a biphasic segmented model. What I found is that there was a 0 0.7 uh, decline in bacterial levels the first 106 hours after contamination. Then after 106 hours, that die-off decreased to about 0.2. What I really want you to notice here is that all the die-off rates that were reported are within one log of what I found and of each other. This really, this is a big deal, and I'll get into that in a second, but what this really illustrates is by kind of literally mapping the pre-existing research onto my mental model, I was able to identify not only commonality and study design and approach and everything, but it's identified key patterns in the relationship. Now, the reason the fact that all these numbers are within one log of each other is so big is because the federal government just passed the first attempt to regulate fresh produce safety in the nation's history. Part of this, they established agricultural water standards. And if a farmer, you know, as I said, farm environments are not clean, your water is not always going to meet standards. So they created a kind of a loophole. If your water doesn't meet the standards, use the water. However, your, once the pathogen from the crop has to decline to acceptable levels. Um, and the problem with that is we don't really have good science to base our rate to determine how fast that pathogen is going on. The fact that all this is in one log suggests it's going to be getting close. So you can use, I use this in thinking not only to place my research in the context of existing research, but also to place in the context of my other research. Uh, so I do a lot of very kind of random projects based off of who we get grants from. Um, and so I had a hard time as I was going to write my dissertation, figuring out how they related to each other. So basically what I had, my earlier projects, looked at the effect of landscape structure and uh, land and farm management practices on microbial loads in soil, water, and feces, and the transfer of, you know, all of this from feces onto produce. Now that project I just showed you didn't really seem to fit into that. Well, this all transfers to the produce, and that study looked at the transfer and die-off of pathogens on produce. You can then relate this all to this at consumption. Now I want to pull this all the way back and kind of take it full circle. I talked a lot about these multiple different mental models today and how I use them. However, I want to make it clear that these are all the aspects, these are all the same model. All three of these are picturing the same thing. And who might want to use them is very different. Let's say you're the plant manager for this processor and you're trying to identify hazards and sort of control points to base your food safety. You might really want to use this. It's very linear. It's very easy to understand the flow chart, et cetera. So, let's say you're a farmer and your buyer wants you to implement both conservation 
and food safety programs. Well, this is image tried to help you show that. In fact, this is actually prepared by the Wild Farm Alliance to help growers do that. Now, let's say you're a graduate student and you're trying to write your dissertation and you're trying to figure out how things uh, work together, work from the existing literature. You might use this type of model. So basically, there's lots of different applications of this thinking in produce safety, and not just produce safety, but these things can be generalized. Now, I want to thank pretty much. Well, I'm done, but let's thank these people. Thank you.